I felt better. <laughs> I felt better, right? So I felt my positive, my inspiring self again by my lake. And I was running along, feeling good. Um, and I, at that point, my husband had told me, hey, you're leading the race, you know, so it was really awesome. Um, I was picturing all of these positive images in my head about how I was feeling and how I was competing and even runs that I had gone on during my training that really exemplified and showed me that I could keep this pace that I was running. But then again, the doubt and the fear crept in about mile 21, right? So now I have five miles left in the race. It became very difficult. Um, and we approached this hill that was about a mile long. And uh, as I turned this hill, I saw the second place woman behind me. And I thought to myself, oh man, you know, maybe I won't, we we'll won't win this race. So it was really important to me because it just kind of symbolized to me how hard I had worked, right? And the doubt kept on, uh, you know, crept in again. And for about a half mile, I just got down on myself. Man, this, this doesn't feel good. This is hard. Uh, can I do this? Uh, you know all that stuff that happens when you're really pushing yourself. And again, I started to work to control my mind. I said positive things to myself. I had a mantra that I had planned to say to myself over and over again in the race, and that was, I'm strong, I'm confident, and I'm happy. I'm strong, confident, and happy. Because I knew actually that's how I ran my best if I told myself those things, right? Um, and so I, uh, then I, I turned a corner, which is kind of odd in a, in a race, and then I saw the, 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 the face of the second place runner. And I realized that she was in just as much discomfort as me, right? And it just, it gave me this, um, this feeling that I could, I could handle anything. That the marathon uh, is about pushing through your fears and it's about pu pushing through your discomfort. And so I'm pleased to say that I ran my last three miles of that race faster than any other mile. And that's a really big deal to me because, um, because I think you can do anything you put your mind to, right? And even if in the race you're feeling some discomfort, you can, you can handle anything. And that's what I really learned from that race is that despite the fear, despite the doubt, which I think everybody experiences, you can handle anything. And I was thinking about how fear is really important for this group because I have learned that it's um, some of your first races, right? And so I think fear of just the unknown can really stop you. But the more and more I experience fear and work towards pushing through it, the more and more I, I study how, how people and athletes like yourself push through peer, fear, you know how they push through it? They feel it and they do it anyway. They feel it and they do it anyway. Because fear is part of the human nature. It's part, you're always gonna experience fear, um, especially if you're pushing yourself, especially if you're doing new things that you haven't done before. Everybody experiences fear regardless of um, what that new thing that they're doing is, right? So we all experience fear when we're pushing ourselves when we're doing something new. And so I think that can be really calming when you just know, know that everybody at the starting line is feeling some of that, right? Um, even if it's the, the, the man or woman who might win the race, they're still feel, feeling that fear, right? So I think that's calming. And I thought I would describe to you some strategies that I've used in my own running, in my own life, that could help you push through that, to help calm yourself, uh, because I think to really, for you to, to be at your best, um, you need to have a calm mindset, right? And that's why I decided to wear the shirt that said, keep calm and marathon on. <laughs> because, you know, part of just enjoying it is, is, is being calm. And so the first strategy I thought I would tell you about is just the strategy of being grateful when you're out there training and when you're out there in the race because you can't experience fear and gratitude at the same time, it's impossible. So I think just being grateful for the opportunity to raise money like you are, to be grateful for the opportunity to uh, be out, be active, and run or walk or whatever you choose to do. And that's one of the things I always try to do in every single race that I run, is just really be grateful for the opportunity. Um, and I ran this really awesome race last two Sundays ago, it was a 20 mile race at White Bear Lake. 
And it was amazing. It was amazing because of my mindset, because I really just enjoyed every single minute. And I enjoyed even the discomfort that I was feeling. Right? And one of the reasons I wanted to tell you about that, my story at the Oman Marathon is because you might experience discomfort in the race. You will if you're pushing yourself, right? And there's a difference between discomfort and pain. I'm talking about the discomfort that comes from running, right? And so the more you can actually be grateful just to experience that discomfort, it can really help you. And one of my really good friends named Becky Brudwick, uh, who sometimes I run with, you told me that for every mile when she runs her marathon, she dedicates that mile to somebody else, right? So for when she runs a marathon, it's 26 miles where she dedicates that, you know, every mile to somebody else. And that, that's what I think is really important about being grateful is because you take the, take the focus off yourself and you're just grateful for the opportunity. Grateful for the opportunity that a lot of people don't get, you know, just by walking or running the race. So the first strategy to overcome fear is be grateful. Because you can't experience fear and gratefulness at the same time. The second strategy that I use in my own life, in my own running, is what's called a three to one ratio. And if any of you heard me speak, you've probably heard me speak about this because I think it's a really easy strategy to implement. Um, and what this strategy is, is, is that really for every uh, one negative emotion, we should experience three, three positive emotions. And this, re this three to one ratio is based on a book called Positivity by a really well-known researcher named Barbara Fredrickson. And she's a researcher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And so after 25 years of examining positivity, she has discovered this ratio that people, when they flourish, when they get the most out of their life and out of their performance, they have a three to one ratio. So three positive emotions for every one negative. I think gratitude and happiness, positivity, all those are positive emotions, right? So what's really interesting about her research, however, is that when we have the opposite, when we have a one to three, so one positive to three negative emotions, we go in a downward spiral. It predicts depression. And that's when I don't think that we actually are, are ever at our best. Right, so if you, uh, if you approach the race where it's like, oh, you know, I can't do this, I'm really nervous, this is impossible, you're creating all of these emotions that aren't gonna allow you to really be your best. Right? And our thoughts, our emotions start with our thoughts. So instead of having the negative emotions, what we have to do is replace with positive, right? And say things like, of course I can do this. This is gonna be an awesome opportunity that I can't wait for. And so when we just work to change what we're thinking about, it change our, changes our emotions. When we have what's called a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, we, we're stagnant, we don't change. And you can probably think of times in your life where you've maybe had the one-to-one, -one, Right? You just kind of feel like you're maybe not pushing yourself, you're not changing, you're not enjoying life. Right? So the easiest way to do that is work to change your thoughts. What are you thinking about? Where is your focus going? Because where your focus goes you know, is where your energy flows. So a uh, second strategy to overcome fear is have a three to one. It's really easy to remember. Some people that I work with will say, well, okay, if I have a, a negative thought or a negative emotion, I'll just replace it with three positive. Right, so it's an easy way that you can just start implementing it in your life. So uh, first strategy we talked about is uh, experiencing gratitude, right? You can't experience fear and gratitude at the same time. Second strategy is three to one ratio. And uh, the third strategy I thought I would talk about is the importance of just imagining the race going well. I uh, recently read this article during the Winter Olympics by this uh, slalom skier, Michaela Shifflin. And if you watched the Winter Olympics, you maybe saw her. She was an 18-year-old Olympian. It was the first time she had ever been in the Olympics. And it was really cool because, you know, she, she said this to her, well, during the Olympics, you maybe saw a lot of the skiers actually doing imagery before they started. So they would actually be moving their arms and flapping their hands. And they would, you know, be going like this before, before they went down the hill. So it's really cool. It was a really great example on prime time of how actually sports psychology helps with the athletes. And uh, she was interviewed uh, after she won the slalom, and she said, "You know what? People think this is my first Olympic Games, but it's not. 
She said, this is my thousands Olympic games because that's how many times I've imagined this race in my head. And I thought, wow, isn't that so cool, right? Uh, because she had already been there, she was already used to it. And that's the advice I give to you. Just, you know, sometimes I think when we feel the fear, feel the fear and fear the anxiety or doubt of doing something different, you know, the images that we're picturing in our head is, are, are negative things. Like we're, th we're picturing the worst case scenario instead of the best case scenario, right? We're thinking about all the things that could go wrong or we're thinking about you know, possibly not finishing instead of the things that could go right. And so if you picture all the possible things that could go right in the race, and I think this applies to your life too, right? All the things that possibly could go right, that's gonna allow you to, to push through the fear. And then the last strategy I thought I would describe to you um, is an is a easy, easy uh, strategy called a mantra. And I described to you what my mantra was for the Omaha Marathon. Uh, sometimes in my races, I switch it up and I don't always have the same one because it's usually something that I really need to remind myself of, like uh, something that I really need to kind of push myself to do. And I always have the goal of, of staying positive the whole race. Sometimes that, that's easier, uh, sometimes it's more difficult. But I think if you have that same goal, it'll really help you as well. Because what we know is you can't reach your best when you're negative, right? When you have that, the negative emotions or the, the negative thoughts. Instead, when you're, um, when you're flexible, and I, I like that idea of like um, being a bamboo and, and bending, right? And so you know, there's a lot of things that we can't control in a race like other runners or we can't control uh, you know, if you, sometimes what happens to me is I, I run by the water stop too fast and I miss water. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes it happens. <laughs> um, you know, you can't control that, right? Um, so, and you know, I know you're kind of laughing maybe because you might think, well, I might be walking through the water stop, right? <laughs> the, the weather we can't control. Um, you know, I always haven't been a competitive marathoner. Um, when uh, when my, my last son was born, I hadn't ran probably for a good seven months. And for people who know me, they probably think, wow, really, seven months you didn't run? Um, and it was really, really difficult to get back in. And I, I specifically remember how difficult it was. I went on some training runs with the group when I couldn't keep up, and I was probably about 30 pounds heavier. And uh, I had a lot of self-doubt, a lot of fear because you know, I couldn't even do the things that I, that I was used to doing. So, um, and there are times that I have walked as well. <laughs> so I think you have to embrace where you're at, right? Embrace where you're at. And the, the, the last strategy I thought I'd talk about is, is a mantra. So what a mantra is, is a short instructional phrase you can say to yourself to, to stay focused. So one of the mantras I had for the Omaha Marathon was, um, was I'll feel better in a mile. I'll feel better in a mile. Another one was I'm strong, I'm fast, and I'm I'm happy. Right? Because that's how I knew I ran my best. So uh, at the end of my talk, we have some mantra sheets where you can think about maybe something that you want to say to yourself during the race. And if you have it planned out, actually beforehand, it's really it's really better because in the race sometimes. You know, I think that's when the negativity can creep in, especially if you're not used to it, if it's your first one. Um, and even for me, when I'm really pushing, uh, you know, the negativity is a lot harder to fight off. So I think mantras are best when they start with I am statements. What we know is I am, I will, those kind of statements lead to about 90 to 80% success rate. Instead of saying things to yourself like I can't or I won't, right? That leads to about 10 to 20% success rate. So uh, statements like I am, you know, I can do anything I put my mind to. I can, I'm, I'm flexible, right? I'm happy. Anything that you want to say to yourself. And then you can say, say that to yourself over and over and over and over again. Because your mind can't think about two things at once, right? So it can't think about... Um, the discomfort you feel, or the fear that you feel, and what your the power powerful statements that you're putting into your mind. Okay, so so far we've talked about that. You know, fear happens at all times if you're pushing yourself to new levels, right? If you're doing new things different. We've talked about four different strategies you can use to overcome fear.
We talked about feeling grateful. We talked about having the three to one ratio. And then we talked about imagining a successful, a successful race. And then we talked about a mantra. And uh, when I was thinking more about fear to prepare to talk to you, I was thinking about a good acronym for fear. And I was thinking, I can't believe anyone has come up with this before. But fear is feel, feel everything and run. <laughs> feel everything and run. Um, because really the point is you're going to feel it, right? So just feel it and run. Just do it anyway. So I, I, I wish you the best of uh, the best in the next couple of weeks. And I wish you a positive and productive mindset on race day. Um, my staff with the sports psychology, uh, the sports psych team will be at the expo the day before the race. If you'd like to talk to anybody there, there were going to be in yellow shirts. And so they could give you more mental tips if you'd like. And then I will be, as well as um, our staff from the center, we're going to be on bikes uh, for at least the half marathon and marathon course. So if you need some positivity, just you know, wave us down. We'll be on bikes throughout the race. Uh, and then a few things I have to leave you with is I have uh, some wristbands that say be mentally strong. You can wear them during the race to kind of remind you what we talked about today. Um, and maybe perhaps you could even write your mantra on a marker in the inside. Um, sometimes what I do is actually write my mantra on my arm. So, uh, and you know, it's sometimes really bold so that I can remind myself of it and to remind myself to say it over and over and over again. And then we do have some mantra sheets uh, where you can write your mantras if you'd like. Remember those should be I am and I can statements. So again, um, enjoy the race. Push through the fear because it's part of doing something new. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Sandra. That was wonderful encouragement. And um, we have a couple of things we're going. We're waiting in here today. So um, one thing is I need all the coaches to come up because we need to introduce ourselves. The other thing is if there are children three and under that you have not taken to the nursery yet and you want to, the nursery is available. And but lastly, if you are a runner and you have not signed up for the drawing yet, those sheets are back there by a little denim basket, with a basket with denim on it. Please sign up because we are going to do the drawing. We want to make sure anybody who is a runner has signed up for that course. So, all right, I'm going to let the coaches introduce themselves. Keep on uh, pushing on that and, and working on that. And speaking of that, 
our um, top fundraiser, Mr. Chuck Kind, is our next speaker. And um, my name for Chuck is Fashion Fashionista because at our group runs, he matches. He has white and blue shoes that match his vision shirt. So anyway, Fashionista Chuck Kind. No. <laughs> there you go. That is the worst thing that you'll hear in Aspen. And I can tell you, I've asked a lot of people, and to this point, I've gotten zero no's. Now, I've had people that have not responded, right? I've had people that have not responded, but I, I, I can tell you this. Uh, I'm in sales, it was kind of interesting, we were at the group run, uh, and every Saturday, for those of you who have not been involved in the group runs, I really encourage you to do that. Um, they, they kind of do a little bit of talk about whether it's hydrating. Uh, how many of you got a little bit nervous at Lisa Petra's email about toenails? Right? My toenails are fine, I have nothing to worry about till then, right, with the emails. But, so every time before we get into the race, uh, there's some type of, of, of prep, you know, prep talk. It's you know, hydrating. Uh, it's proper clothing. Uh, you know, we talked about goop and jelly beans and stuff like that. So one, one of them was, and I didn't even know I was going to be speaking, was um, Carrie said, you know, today's about fundraising. So she talked a little bit about fundraising, and she says, Chuck's the top fundraiser. Would you mind telling us what it is that you do? And for those of you who don't know me, I'm in sales. Um, and and if, you, if, you, if you want to know how good I am in sales, look at my wife, right? Is I definitely have not my punt coverage, so I'm good at this. But, um, you know, to me, it, it, it's just natural, and, and what I would tell you is there's a phrase that we use in sales all the time, and I shared this when I was a sales manager, is the answer is no unless you ask, right? If you don't ask, you've already gotten a no from everybody that you know. I'm sorry, I used two different phrases of the word no, right? <laughs> but if you don't ask, the answer is no. Uh, it's kind of the old phrase, too, that you're going to miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So what I would really encourage you to do is start asking, right? Start asking. Because let me share with you, the worst that you can get is what? No. Let me share with you what I and some of the others of you have gotten by asking. I went on walls, these first ones are from my wall, when I asked people. And these were comments that I got. Keep running, great cause, good luck. You the man, of course I am, right? Um, still amazed by all your accomplishments to call, I am proud to call you friend. If any one person can change the world, it's you, go Chuck. You're a good man and this is a great cause. It is little things like this that will make the world a better place. Well done, boss. I'm blessed to have you as a friend. Congrats on this new commitment to be a steward of our plan. Good luck. I'm sending you wonderful wishes on your successful run. Run for the love of God. The worst I heard were the two following comments. Chuck, what a wonderful cause. I've seen you run before. Is there a time limit on you? <laughs> Also, good job, Chuck. I would pay some more money for a before and after close-up photo of your face. <laughs> so, then I went into other people's sites, and again, these are people that I uh, asked. Um, what a caring thing to do for those less fortunate than us. Run, Kathy, run. You are truly an inspiration. What a wonderful cause to run for. Love you. We're proud of you. I heard the words, we're proud of you so many times on so many different sites that people have. We're proud of you for participating in such a good cause. Christy, I love that you're doing this. Thanks for the chance, thanks for the chance to support you and to help World Vision provide clean water for those who need it. We love Team World Vision and we love you. Thank you for doing such an amazing thing, a wonderful gift to others and yourself. That's what people got for asking. They didn't get no's, right? 
So, you know, what I would tell you is, you gotta get started. First of all, you gotta get started. Uh, it's really difficult to steer a parked vehicle. That's kind of a phrase I've always used with my kids too. Sorry, you're getting a little, a little bit of kind parenting here. Uh, so you gotta get started. The first thing I tell you is, uh, committed to the Lord. I know there are some of you that have not even set up your sites. So make sure that you go on uh, Team World Vision, set up your, your website, uh, put your story on there. Brad's gonna be talking a little bit about that. What I would tell you then too is also commit to the Lord, right? The, 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 the fundraising to the Lord. Proverbs 16, three says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plan. The other thing I'd have you be thinking about as you're going through this is that know that God is favoring you in this effort, right? That God wants you to win as you're doing this. And I was thinking about three different stories in the, in, in, uh, the Bible is how many plagues was it that, that Moses brought on the Egyptians and God? It was dozens of them, right? I mean, like frogs, and, right? And, and just before he left, God says, I'm going to cause the Israelites to have favor with the Egyptians. Really? I mean, you're getting all this rotten stuff caused to you because of the Israelites? And before they left, the Egyptians gave them gold and gave them this. Why? Because our God's in charge of the purse strings, Right? Um, also, if you think about the story of Joseph, if you think about the story of Daniel, what did God do? God gave them favor, right? So when you go out, just think of the fact that God is going to give you favor in this. Um, start, set up your page, uh, give the seed money, because I did go on, and, and I know it's kind of scary that, that somebody's checking this. I went on our site, I went through there. Some of you haven't even asked yourself yet for money, okay? So the seed money is, you know, one of my favorite lines is an Eleanor Roosevelt quote that says, uh, it is unfair to ask of others what you're not willing to do yourself. So show them that you're willing to support this cause for the for, for uh, clean water. Um, you'd be the first one on your site that gives the money. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, what I've done in regards to um, raising money here. So the first thing that I did was, um, I, I sent out an email to a lot of coworkers. And what I did is I did not do a group email. I wrote one email, I sent it to a lot of people over and over and over again. And I just wanted to show you how easy it was. The subject was running for a cause. And the first one I sent it to was a good friend of mine, Joe. I said, Joe, I'm running a half marathon in October. It'll be the first time I'm running for a t-shirt. Had numerous runs this long in the military in boots with a, and with a rifle. But more importantly, I'm running for World Vision Water Projects. These wells will support women and children who sometimes have to walk eight hours a day just to get brackish water for their families. I'm asking people to give whatever they can. $50 will provide the funds to give one person clean drinking water for their entire lives. <clears throat> Beyond the water, it transforms their lives. If you're interested in donating, go to www.give the website and look for me as a team member. I thank you, and so does someone who will never be able to thank you. Regards, and then just my name, right? Uh, I probably sent that to, I don't know, 50, 60 coworkers. I still send it when I bump into people that I'd forgotten about uh, in terms of that. Um, I went through my contacts list, so if any of you, if I have your phone number, Unfortunately, I didn't send them to you because I knew you were running this, right? Um, but maybe I was shameless enough that I would have sent you names. But I went through my contact list and sent text to people, right? Same thing. Uh, went to Facebook, sent individual messages to people. Um, I, I put Facebook posts on all the time. Uh, I wear the bracelet uh, all the time. Uh, whenever people ask me, you know, how are you? What are you doing? They get to hear my story, right? So, um, what I would tell you is, seriously, no, that's the worst you'll hear. And I guarantee you that that's not what you're going to hear. Is I tell you, start, uh, have fun. And still at this point, if someone wants to, they give me my first note. I haven't gotten to know yet. So, thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Just before I introduce Bradley, if you have not put your name in for prizes, don't forget to do it, because you can't win if you don't put it in there, right? You listen to Chuck? Okay, so Bradley Hoffbauer, I've known him since I think, 2008, long time. So he's awesome, he's the cheerleader behind all this, he's motivational, 
So he's the Team Royal Vision guru. So come on up. Official title, events director, Quincy's <laughs> area. No. So it just changed that on Monday, so whatever. Titles don't matter. Uh, anyway, who here is a, is a runner or running their first race this time? Raise your hand if you're running on the team. Running on the team. That's okay, running on the team. Okay, raise your hand if you're a family member. Family member who's here supporting. Okay, family members, my first word is to you. Your role is critical. Critical, right? I can't even tell you how critical it is. You have, your support is the most valuable thing uh, that the participant will experience throughout the year, if you're a family member. Being on mission together in a family is probably one of the most important things that will bind you together as a family. You've heard people say, play together, stay together. No, no, on mission together, stay together, right? You're on mission together, you will stay together, right? Because you are, you are with, you are combining yourselves for a purpose. So the best thing that you can do is carve time, carve space, and carve out support, even when it's hard. I'm married with two kids, so I know how hard it is to always support a spouse or a family member. Um, Carve out space in your mind to always support for this specific thing. It's never, they're doing this, I'm doing something else. It is, we are doing this. We are doing this together, okay? So just remember that. I'm gonna grab a clicker and what's up here. They're like reading my mind. So I wanted to start, I just wanted to start with that, um, and then I wanted to get to a few stories to help you. So, <clears throat> has anyone here ever run for a cause before? Have you ever run for any cause? Okay, was it research related? Yes? Who's with, with me? Yeah. <laughs> with me. Team World Vision. No one's run for any other cause. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> The reason that's amazing is because the top grossing, oh, you have, okay, what, what group? St. Jude's. Okay, perfect. I have Watch for Alzheimer's. Watch for Alzheimer's. Okay, these count. All right, when you were doing that, was it because you know someone maybe who is dealing with Alzheimer's? Okay. Anybody ask you the ROI on the research, return on investment rate? No, of course not. Okay. All of a sudden you get to water projects, people are like, well, what's the art of life? water project, right? What's the deal there? What's the deal there? Let me tell you what the deal is. The deal is water projects aren't personal. You don't know anybody who's suffering without water, unless you sponsor a kid, in which case you do know somebody who doesn't have any water access. All right, the reason I bring this up is because running for a purpose is personal. It is personal. And if you make it some third party objective thing that is not personal, then it will be exactly that and it will come across, across to others as exactly that. And they will have a hard time supporting you, a harder time. Now, Chuck has already said, and I would agree with this, that if you're asking people, they're giving. Right? Because there's, I don't know how many times I'm watching Hulu, because that's the only way I watch TV, Hulu.com or whatever, watching streaming TV, and a commercial comes across about clean water or hunger or schools or whatever, and I'm always like, damn, that's a good cause, I should probably give to that. Oh, except I'm watching my show right now. Right? People want to give. They like see the thing and they're like, oh man, I should really do that. Oh, I'm doing this other thing. Right? So we need to give people the opportunity, like Chuck said, to actually participate. I wanted to make it a little bit more personal for you, so I'm, I brought a couple of stories with me. I thought you might like that. I went, to Af I went to Kenya a couple of years ago, and I got to meet these kids. Uh, this is a school in an area called Bartabwa. World Vision started working in Bartabwa, Kenya in about 2009. 
Child mortality rate at the time, 2009, 50%. 50% of kids weren't living past the age five. How many kids we have in that program right now? 50% of the kids weren't living past age five. I got to this school, this school had just gotten clean water access through a rain catchment system. So they just put giant gutters on the side of their school building, funnel it into this huge container off to the right, and then have a filter inside, just pick it off to the side here. School enrollment, this, is, this was a year old, this project was a year old, school enrollment had tripled. Tripled. Those are the happiest kids at school I've ever seen. Right? So this is just one story. In one year, the school enrollment tripled. Oh, well, that's probably uncommon. No, it's not. Actually, sometimes it's more than triple. When you bring in clean water, you're not just bringing clean water, you're bringing education to a community that wasn't there before. This is maybe one of my favorite pictures of all time. So this is Don and Cindy. Don and Cindy went with me to Kenya. Don and Cindy combined sponsored 26 kids. <laughs> they write to them every single month. I sponsor six and write to them like once a year. So I'm feeling pretty terrible next to these two. They're incredible people. We go to this project um, in Bartawa. The community was given three options for a, for a water access point. So when World Vision brings a, a clean water uh, solution to a region, they actually work with the community and let them decide which type of intervention they want to they use. The reason we let them decide is because they're going to have to contribute part of the intervention. So it's going to take something from them. So for this specific project, the project was actually like three quarters of the way up a mountain, the top of a mountain. There was no road that went up there. So in order to get a road, the people had to build a road. When we started working this, in this community in 2009, there were no roads that even went to this community. So when I got there, there was one road that ended at the World Vision compound. It took two hours in a Land Rover to get there. One road that ended at the World Vision compound. We drove another hour and a half to get to this mountain. When we got there, the driver turns around and says, hold on. We basically go to an almost vertical incline in a Land Rover, and our wheels are spinning the entire time as rocks are crumbling down behind us. And uh, Bernardo Suna, who's kind of talking to them, you can really see him because the lighting's kind of bad. Bernardo Suna, he's our water director for this region. He's our water engineer in Bartabla. Since 2010, when he had started, this is 2012, this picture's taken. Since 2010, he had, he had launched 72 water projects in this community. This one had just been completed two months prior. And, I, and he turns around, he, he's talking to us as we're going up this mountain. I'm like, what's the deal with this road? He goes, well, when we told them that we were going to do this water project up here, they had to build the road. They had to build tools out of sticks, rocks, and metal that they found. And for 18 months, men and boys in this community broke rocks every single day for 18 months to build a road. They're not engineers. Within a week after the road was complete, we had a bulldozer here. These men that you see in the foreground are part of that Water Users Association that helped recruit all the people from that village to come and build this road. These guys were jumping up and down. You know why? In the back of the picture, you can see on the top right hand side, it's raining. The rainy season had just started. You can see that this is empty. The rain is coming across the Rift Valley, and it's about to fill this container. 14 million liters of water. For the first time in their lives, these guys are going to have access to clean water at a tap. They're jumping up and down. Right? 
Guys, when people pray their entire lives for basic human necessity, and then they finally get it, the overwhelming sense of joy, the overwhelming sense of joy that they feel dwarfs the sense of joy that we feel crossing the finish line, but it's something that connects us to one another. Right? The difficulty that you might have had signing up for this race is dwarfed by the difficulty of facing no access to clean water for your entire life with no foreseeable way out of it. But it's a connection that makes it personal for you. Right? That makes it personal for me. Do not diminish that connection by saying that it's nothing. Because it is something. It is something to feel that joy and that difficulty, that fear that she talked about at the beginning. Right? Hold on to that because that thing is what connects us to these people who we're serving. So it's maybe the only thing that connects us together. So we've got to hold on to that. That human feeling is what connects us. We're essentially telling people, you have human dignity. And so do we. Right? And we get human dignity by telling them that they have dignity. And vice versa. So just know that these, these are just two stories. Go to the World Vision website, watch some videos, cry at 1 a.m. because you're watching or whatever, over noon hour because you're skipping work. And whatever, go watch some videos and just let yourself be taken with this. Let it become personal, right? Okay. Then, learn how to tell your story. And I'm going to help you do this right now. We're actually going to work on it a little bit right now. So, we're going to start. Can I get somebody to come and help me pass out some papers? I'm going to help you. Out. So, we're just going to give papers to everybody at the tables. Give them plenty. Um, I'm going to kind of talk you through this just a little bit. Do not overcomplicate this, but I'm gonna, we're going to get a little bit... We're going to get started here. All right, as you get your piece of paper, here's what I want you to do. Don't talk to anybody about it. Just think in your own mind, during this entire season, I don't care if you're running or doing dishes or doing laundry or taking a shower or watching TV or whatever it was, during this entire season, since you said that you would join the team and run a race, which you thought was crazy maybe, since you said that you would do that, has there been any moment that you can recall that you thought about clean water? Has there been any moment where you have, where you have thought to yourself, huh, I wonder what I would have done without this water, right? Maybe you were on a run and you thought, about something specific, rain or something. Just think about a couple of moments. I'm going to be quiet here for like two minutes because I can't be long, quiet longer than that. So I'm going to be quiet for two minutes and I want you to think and I want you to write down, you can write down a sentence, you can write down a word. I want you to write down, maybe it was in the first time when I came and spoke at church, maybe you were there and maybe it was then, maybe it was when you went home, I don't know. I'm going to shut up here for two minutes and let you write and think. Okay, hopefully you have some written down. Okay. I want to, I want to teach you, or I want, to, I want to have you start practicing how to tell this story. That story that you wrote down. Okay? Um, I'm going to give you an example of one of mine. Now you can't steal it. You've already written yours down. So don't take any of my ideas. No, actually take my ideas, but apply them to your story. Okay? Don't retell my story. If, if you have to retell my story to practice, that's okay. <clears throat> but retell it to yourself. 
Uh, you got to hear good stories and you got to retell good stories to get good at this. Now, it might be retelling them, it might be writing them, out of whatever kind of way of telling that you do. But I'm going to give you one of my last years. It's a true story. Last year, I was training for, my, for a marathon. It was my fourth one. Um, I start the season. I go out for a three-mile run. I've done four marathons. I'm going for a three-mile run. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. So I get out. Uh, it's like March in the worst state ever. So when I get a quarter mile into the run, it starts sleeting, of course. Sleeting. I'm like a quarter mile in. I'm like, really? The weather was like sunny a second ago. It was like a second. It was whatever. So I keep going. I get to a lake because I live in the Twin Cities and they're everywhere. So I get to a lake. And the wind coming off this lake is driving the sleet into my eyes. I can't even look up. I'm just like looking down at the ground, like running with my back hunched over. Cars are driving by, and in my head I'm thinking, these people are like, look at the idiot. <laughs> look at the idiot out here in shorts and a t-shirt when it's sleeting. What a moron. Go home, buddy. You're not saving anybody, okay? So I'm running, I'm annoyed. Within like less than another minute, there's like a quarter inch of sleet on the ground, and I'm just slipping. My legs are slipping in the, like I'm running in sand. And I just stop. This is so dumb. I'm gonna hurt myself. In the first training run of the season, I'm going home. This is really silly. So I stop, I get ready to turn around and go home. I have this thought pop into my mind. What if my three-year-old son was thirsty? And the only way to get him a drink was to endure elements for three miles. So I start crying, finish my three mile run. Now I finish that run, right? And I've got two options. I can dismiss that and let it be something that I experience that's really personal, that's like something close to my heart that I hold on to, and every time I look at my son, it changes the way I look at him, and it changes the way I do my... Or, I could do what God is probably trying to get me to do, which is to tell that story to other people. Right? I would not have thought that if I would have back in 2006, not chosen to run for clean water projects. I would not have had that thought, very likely. But because three, four years prior, five, that was a long time ago, because in 2006, I had chosen to run for clean water, now, all of a sudden, last year, 2013, I'm running a random run in the middle of really bad weather, and. I have this thought about clean water that can turn into a story that would make a parent of a three-year-old, just like me, want to do something sacrificial to give, to, to change somebody's situation. Right? Here's what we need to do. We need to be able to see our story in the context of the rest of the story. And then we need to write it, tell it, write it again, tell it again, write it again, tell it again, write it again, tell it again, tell it again, tell it again, until you're sick of the story, until it comes out in 30 seconds at a party, at church, at work. And somebody leaves the conversation with the question, man, what can I do to help? Right? What can I do to help? Even better than that, what would be better is at the end of the conversation, tell them what they could do to help. Right? You could fit, I could easily finish that story with, so I decided that I had to finish my run. I have realized that I can do something to change the lives of other people. What you could do to support me in this is come and cheer for me on race day. You could make a donation. It would make me feel incredible. 
In fact, we get these text messages whenever someone donates to our page on our phone. And I'm going to have my phone with me when I go for a run tomorrow. If I went for a run tomorrow at 3 p.m., let's just say that happened, and I got a text message that said that someone donated, I would be incredibly encouraged. Right? Position this, this stuff so that people can help. All right, so that's, that's our goal. That's your goal, is you want to get that story that you wrote down to this place. I want to help you with this. Find your starting line. Maybe you say, I have shared my story and I don't have anyone else to ask. Let me just pause right there with you. Yes, you do. Right? Yes, you do. You have tons more people to ask. No, I don't. I already went through my, Chuck, I already went through my whole list. Right? Even Chuck said, there's people who I'm still following up with because they haven't responded. They haven't said no, but they haven't responded yet. That's the right attitude. You do have someone else to ask. Or maybe you had a conversation with someone that went something like this. I'm running a race for clean water projects in Africa. And they were like, my friend started this thing for clean water projects in like this one place, maybe Africa. It's probably the same thing as World Vision. Have you heard of that thing before? Let me tell you about it. Blah, 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 blah. End of the conversation. You're like really discouraged. I ran a marathon one time. It was horrible. Blah, 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 blah. Right? That is not what you want for the end of the conversation. So if you had a conversation like that, that person was not saying, no, I don't want to support you. They were focused on their thing. You need to go back and ask them again. Right? You need to go back and represent. Represent. <laughs> you need to represent. See that? I've tried to tell my story, but I don't feel effective. Okay, why don't you feel effective? How are you presenting your story? Right, this is a little bit more of what we're gonna cover here in a minute. I have one or more stories that I have shared in conversations. I have one or more stories that I have written down. Maybe this is you right now, right? You're like, just getting started with that. Some people say this, I don't know my story. Some people say I don't have a story. Liar. <laughs> you ever meet people who are like, ah, I wish I was like a drug dealer before I became a Christian because then I'd have a real story. To tell. <laughs> That's like me, right? Oh man, I wish I was like a real, I wish I had real problems before. You didn't have real problems. You're just not honest with yourself about all the problems that you have, right? So we need to identify that we do have a story. We can share them in conversation and then we can write them down. We can be effective, and that we have not asked everyone that we know. Now, just identify your situation. Be fully honest with yourself. Have you identified your story? Or two, or three of them? Have you shared them in conversation or tried? What has gone really poorly about that? What has gone really well? Have you tried sending an email? What went poorly? What went well? Let me give you a few strategies right there. If you sent a group email, what people hear is this. I don't have to respond because I'm invisible in a group. That's how people will respond. That's how I respond when I get a group email. And I'm like part of this whole thing. So I just don't respond, right? But if somebody sends me an email that's addressed to me like what Chuck did, now I feel like I have to respond. Well, he wrote it right to me. I can tell you what's even more effective if two days later I get an email that was like, did you get my email? <laughs> if I get an email two days later with the only words, did you get my email, I'm gonna be like, yes. Oh, I hate email. But I have to write yes because I did get your email and I want you to hate me, blah, blah, blah. Or you could send a text message. Hey, did you get my message? I did get it, I'm thinking about it. Um, write it down, share it in conversation. I don't feel effective. We're gonna spend some time here, and then I've covered the other one. So, effective interaction. Pitching your, I already mentioned this, but I just wanna bring it back to this. If you say to someone, I'm running a race for clean water projects in Africa, and then they go on a rant, 
about their race or their friend's race or their friend's charity or whatever, that's a pitch. Okay? Some people can pitch and like crush it. I, I've been doing this for seven years. I can pitch Team World Vision to somebody who doesn't want to hear about it and have them sign up for the race by the time I walk away. Because I just have learned every possible response that they could give me and what my responses could be. When she was up here earlier and said that that woman had said she'd been in the Olympics a thousand times, that's how I am with my conversations. I run through my conversation with the same person in my head a thousand times. What if they say this? I would say this. You ever do this after a conversation? You know you do. You like get up, man, I would have said this to him. Next time I see that person, if I'm in that exact same situation again, here's what I would do. Boom. They would really know everything that I think. No, you're not. You're not going to be in that situation again. So I can tell you how to get there before and practice it before the conversation. Plan the conversation to happen eventually. You don't even have to have a person in mind. Plan the conversation. Work through it. Walk through it while you're driving. Turn the radio off. Start working the conversation. So I, I tell people, ditch the pitch. Ditch the pitch. Have a conversation with somebody. Right? Don't pitch things. This isn't sales. Right? It's kind of sales. It's not sales. This is people being given dignity. Right? My dad always said growing up that I would be a great salesman and I hated it when he said that. Because I thought that being a salesman was gross until I found the thing that I could sell no matter what. If you talk to a salesman who loves his job, it's because he found the thing that he could sell that he knew that would help people. That he believed in, that she thought would be incredible for people to experience. Right? I don't tell people to give clean water because I think clean water is a gimmick. I tell people to give clean water because it triples enrollment to school and cuts child mortality rates in half. I tell people to donate to clean water because the clean water crisis is within ending in our generation. That's why I tell people to give clean water. Right? The number one most effective thing that we can do with our money today is give clean water. If you're talking about human health. So that's why I tell people to get clean water. If you embody that, then you won't have to deal with pitching or feeling like you're pitching or selling something. Because you're not. You're telling your story. Right? I couldn't have made up that whole story about the sleet. I couldn't have planned it. I think I'd like to go out for a run today and have it be awful so that I can have a really great experience about clean water. No, that doesn't happen. Right? It's not fake. It's authentic. And so that's where we get here. Uh, storytellers answer questions before they begin. Having all those conversations before you ever start having the conversation. But you've got to answer a few basic questions first. Why do I want to tell this story? I just gave you some answers. Because I want people to have dignity. Why? Could ask every answer to this question should end with another question. Why? Because God has transformed my heart and soul with his behavior of sacrifice to change my life. Why? Because God loves everyone. Why? Because that's his character. You see how it deepens you into the space that it, like matters? Who is my audience? Are you talking to a person who has had experience with clean water or development in the past and is really angry about it? I gave you this one thing one time and blah blah and it was horrible and found out that they were misusing my money. And that's going to change the conversation if you talk to somebody like that and I talk to these people all the time. So you just need to be ready for that. What if you get that question? I can tell you, if you get that question and you're not ready for it, your answer should be, I'll find out. <laughs> right? Don't just lie. I'll find out. 
And then what is your message? What is that story that you're trying to tell? So we're just gonna give, I'm gonna give you a little bit of organization here. Start conversationally. How's it going? It's going pretty well. What are you doing these days? Well, yesterday I went for a run. Whoa, why'd you go for a run? That sounds stupid, <laughs> right? That was kind of stupid. Let me tell you about it, right? Start conversationally, ditch the pitch. You can start with you telling your story. Well, I did this, I felt this way. This is kind of what, what it meant for me. And I felt like everyone I knew could get behind this. In fact, there's a whole group of people at my church who are doing this together. We are doing it like this. We're doing it because kids and communities are in need. Did you know about Congo? Insert facts about Congo. Notice how I didn't start the conversation with, did you know that Congo because if you start the conversation with, did you know about how bad it is in Congo? People will be like, I do. Let me tell you about this other place, right? But if you start with something personal and then move it there, then people are like, huh. I can tell you what I'm doing about that problem. I, so that's why I'm running. I'm choosing to do something about it. Here's how you can help. Right? So your story can follow this. This is like a very generic way to tell your story. But if you follow this kind of rubric for helping you, you can guide your story into this kind of method. Always lead with like, what's the call to action for them and what your follow-up is going to be. Hey, can I text you in two days? I got to talk to my spouse about this. I really want to help with you, but I, we are tight financially. Sweet. That's no problem. Can I text you in a couple days? Just tell me how it went. And this is where, this is where we kind of get to the meat of it. You want this to be personal. You want it to real, reveal your humanity. Guys, if you're not being vulnerable with this, you're missing out on like a million percent of how awesome it can be for you. You're really missing out. The way for this to be effective in your life as a ministry, as a program that will bring you closer to God is to be vulnerable with it. Right? Some of you, for some of you, it might be the first time you've ever been vulnerable about something. You've got to be willing to do that. You've got to be willing to go to a place that might make you cry. Right? It's, it's fake otherwise. I did not go to Africa and see a storm moving across the Rift Valley. I went there, saw that, heard that story. It is in my bones. Right? You've got to just be, it's got to be personal. Um, and then think of that one super important moment. If I think back to that story I told about the sleep, the one super important moment in the story is when I thought about Isaac, my son, my three-year-old son being thirsty. Because I know what it's like to be thirsty. I know the feeling in my mouth. I kind of have it right now. I know what it's like to be thirsty and I know what it's like to have my kid ask me for something that I can't give him. Right? Now, what if those two things were the same? Like a basic human need, he's asking me I can't give him. So you've got to have that super important moment that just like really defines what it is that you're looking at. Um, I want you to take a few minutes here on your own, and I want you to quietly process a little bit more of this story thing and then for about I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a minute to just kind of process a little bit more of that and then for about three minutes after that I want you to discuss with people at your table you guys have like two people so if you want to move to another table that's okay to like jump in with some people but just dialogue a little bit what is your story what, are the what do you think what stuck out to you what's garbage here and then we'll wrap it up for the, for the night
I hope I haven't gone too long for you. You guys freaking out? You're okay, six o'clock. Missed the Bears game already, so no big deal. They lost, the Bears lost. Dang it, how great a Marshall do? It's my fancy. Ah, freaking guy. All right, I'm gonna give you a minute, quiet, four turnovers, are you serious? All right, one minute, quietly, look back to your story, I want you to just drop, jot some notes. Take your time, go. Okay, uh, wrap it up here for a second. All right, just one more thing I wanna, wanna give you and then we'll move into the drawing and you guys can go. Um, here's what you need to do. You need to take the story, whatever you wrote down, whatever you got from this. First of all, was this helpful? Raise your hand if this was a little bit helpful or not helpful, maybe. Okay, all right, that's good. I want you to take the story home. I want you to talk about it. I want you to work on it with whoever's here, with your teammates, right, work on this. I want you to know this. Last year we had 26 people run the New York Marathon. 26. 26 people ran the New York Marathon. They did it for, for our human trafficking component of World Vision. It's called child protection. It's what we call it, World Vision, because we try to really avoid good marketing techniques. So we call it child protection. And um, that is very difficult to fundraise for because it's very complex. And there's no like $50 will break one child out of human slavery. No, it doesn't work that way. It's very complicated. 26 people, they raised $220,000. 26 people. There's probably 26 people in this room right now. Right? Pressure's on. No. I'm just saying, if you get after it and work on this, um, it will make a massive impact. Right? And not only that, race day, if you have worked as hard as you could to change lives throughout this process, it will not only add meaning to your training and to your race, you will cross the finish line in tears. When a person who didn't make it personal, didn't spend the time and energy to consider all that stuff and make it personal, we'll cross the finish line and it'll be a good day. It'll be fine. It'll be a good experience. It'll be something that they look back on as fun. Right? But that's not what I want. I want you crossing the finish line with tears of joy coming down your face about how incredible this experience has been. That's what I want. I want it to be momentous for you. Um, and, and that is ultimately, in my opinion, that is what God wants for the things that we go on mission for in his kingdom. Team World Vision, church, church planting, missions, all of that stuff. He wants that kind of experience for, for us. So, Know that. Let me pray for us real quick, and then we'll do these drawings. God, thank you for moving in this community at Crossview. Thank you for moving wildly in this community, bringing people to um, an incredible point in life where they're willing to say yes uh, to sacrificial behavior that meets the needs of people in the world. Because that is who you are, and that is what you do. You say yes to sacrificial behavior for the sake of relationship. And that is what we choose to do, because you do it. And we are like you. And we pray a thankful, uh, a thankful heart that we would have as we become more like you, and as we learn from you how, how that works, and how that looks in our lives. Um, pray that you would not make this trite, or, um, or simple, simple, but that you would make it uh, invasive into our heart and our life in way more than running, in way more than clean water, but in our families, in our communities, church, co-workers, everything. Uh, that you would just make it clear to the community in Mankato that this is your heart. In your name, amen.
All right, that's all I got. Yeah.